Thank you, Kathy. Is everybody's phone off? Hi, this is Kat Powers, and you're watching Dead Air Live. We're here today with some of the founding mothers and fathers of Somerville Community Access Television. And we're going to be passing the mic around, so it might be you're going to see a hand raised, you're, you might see people uh, jumping in. None of these folks are actually afraid of talking, so we're going to see how the conversation evolves. But I have to start with one question, which is, always asked throughout the city of Somerville. Who came up with the idea of calling it SCAT? <laughs> I might have to take credit for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Howard, it's you. So we're not going to go to any joke lines, but let's just talk about the four words. Mm -hmm. So we talked about Somerville. That's yep. an obvious one. And the initial intention uh, of the channel was just to reach the boundaries of Somerville, which we don't have now, but that was the original intention. Mm -hmm. We talked about community because at the time we were taking the public access channel away from a company that was running it and putting it in the hands of a community, namely Somerville. We talked about access because that was the term of about all the channels that were available for community use, so it was the access channel. And it was about television. It wasn't about streaming, it was a form of television. So. Even though the name SCAT, uh, we can talk about the jazz part of SCAT, that, that, that's okay, uh, <laughs> rather than the scatological jokes. But SCAT was, each, each word in SCAT had some intentionality, and that's, that's how it got its name. So explain to our viewers who have, perhaps you've only learned about SCAT TV through the Somerville Museum exhibit, who are you? So I'm Howard Horton. And uh, at the time of the creation of SCAT, uh, I had the role of uh, executive director of an office of telecommunications in City Hall, uh, working under a very good mayor named Eugene Brune. And uh, at the time, uh, broadcast licenses were given out by the federal communications, but cable licenses, because they use public ways and streets, were given out by the mayor of a city. And uh, that would require a license, and as part of the license, you could require to ha you could require the cable company that's providing the cable television service to provide community channels such as SCAT, which was called a public access channel available to the public. So, Linda, you actually were in cable e even before SCAT started. What was? Could you introduce yourself and what your role was? Yes, I'm Linda Horton, and. Um, I was the director of Mayor Brune's Cable and Television Advisory Board, which consisted of, I don't know, seven or eight uh, residents of Somerville. Mm -hmm. And we, we actually were the board that was responsible for negotiating with, the cab with Warner Cable during the first and second licenses and so prior to the first the second license warner cable television operated public access at that time i was the executive director of the city's educational television channel and also on the board of directors when the license came up for renewal SCAT was created, Somerville Community Access Television was created. We, we didn't really even realize the <laughs> pun on the word, the, you know, what, that it was going to be SCAT mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like the right name. So uh, this was kind of created because it, working with the cable television station didn't work. And I'm going to move the microphone toward Charlie. You have some unique uh, perspective on how that didn't work. So Warner Access, Warner Amex was the cable company at the time. They were just Warner Cable. They were Warner Cable. Yeah. So we're going to put, yep. So what, how did that work? It, it, producers would come in and work with the cable company to get things on air? How, how did it work? 
So they, they ran a separate operation from their normal cable operations. They did local origination. They had a news show, mm -hmm. and they covered some other things. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a separate channel that was set aside for public access, for people in the community to come in and make programs. And they had a, their own educational system for people who didn't know how to make TV, which nobody did really at then. Yeah. So uh, you could come in and take classes and learn how to use the equipment. And then uh, you, and you had to become a, a sort of licensed member. Um, then once you did that, then you could like use the equipment. You could take out portable equipment and do shoots in the, you know, around town or you could do live shows in the studio. Um, and so I was doing that uh, with, with uh, some other people. There weren't a lot of people doing it then, uh -huh. um, on the order of a half dozen or so probably, maybe, maybe 10, I don't know. But anyway, not very many. Um, but the situation w for, with Warner was that they weren't really interested in this public access stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was just a nuisance for them, and it cost them money. And so they really wanted to kill it. So they used, uh, I think it was Nixon who came up with the term uh, benign neglect. Uh, and th that's more or less what they did. So the equipment was just all run down to the point where you couldn't use it. Mm -hmm. or you could use it, but if you did, you wouldn't be able to see on the cable you know, what you had produced because it would be so messed up technically so that was our impetus for you know wanting to have a community managed resource so that we could allocate our own resources and make sure that things worked what kind of it, so to fight crappy equipment no pun in well all right pun intended <laughs> so you had bad equipment you had sometimes hostile relations with the folks who were losing money by having you there. Why did you continue to push to make programming? Well, because we thought it was important. Uh, you know, at the time, there was no Internet. Mm -hmm. There was no way for regular people to put stuff on the cable or on, on TV. Mm -hmm. um, and that television was the dominant medium for people getting their information about what's going on in the world, the community, etc. There were community newspapers back in the day when the journal was a real newspaper. That was, that was a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but times even there have changed. Um, but uh, because that was the only opportunity people had, so it was worth putting some energy into. Uh, the only, that was the only way that the community could develop a voice and a community of communicators, you know, people making stuff and, and watching it and communicating with each other. So that's why we wanted to do it. So, um, Howard, perhaps you could, you could uh, tell us what happened next. So there was a, a handful of folks who saw themselves uh, with the right and the means to express themselves on TV, and then what happened? Yeah, and I just since we're talking about history, I just want to go back a little bit further. Yeah. Because because the concept of public access was really rooted into something th that happened in 1949, which was called the Fairness Doctrine. Mm -hmm. And the Fairness Doctrine related to broadcast channels, and there were only a handful of broadcast channels in each market. So the Federal Communications Commission said, well, if you have uh, treat a controversial issue on a channel, you need to also treat the opposing view on that channel. And, that, and so that there was a fairness requirement. But when cable came along, and now we went from what we called the television of scarcity, as Charlie mentioned, where you only had a few channels, mm -hmm. to what was called the television of abundance, the, the, the Federal Communications Commission said, hey, we don't need to worry about presenting alternative views on one channel. Everyone can have a voice, first come, first serve, on a cable channel called a public access channel. And that happened in 1972. It wasn't until 10 years later that we created SCAT in 1982 to give meaning to those original regulations that provided these channels. And, and subsequently, that fairness doctrine was repealed in 1987 because uh, the policy said, well, communications policy analysts said, now we have enough channels and enough ways for people to express themselves. So 
we listened to the community when we were in City Hall, and, and everyone, I think, was agreed that we didn't want a, uh, uh, someone running it that had benign neglect. We wanted to do something innovative, and we decided that we would uh, instead ask the cable company to take designated funds and put it into a nonprofit corporation and put the operations of the public access channel in the hands of a community organization, not to exert editorial control, but just to make sure that the equipment was good, that the facility ran, that people got trained, and these were people that had the impetus to do something good with it, and they weren't doing it because they were beholden to uh, you know, a, a, a city saying, hey, you have to do this, you're a company. These are people that wanted to do it, and that's the great difference in having SCAT versus Warner Cable running the channel. And I'd like to hand it over to Irwin, because Irwin transitioned, actually. He was the last director of public access working for the cable company and became the first director of the public access channel under SCAT. So, Irwin? Wait, before Irwin starts, I, ju okay. I just want to say that the, the s public access was so big. There was no internet. There was no other way for people to express their views. There was no other way to put a mirror up to our own local life and see it for what it was rather than seeing it filtered through the mass media. Mm -hmm. So this was like a very exciting, energizing experience at the time when there were really no other alternatives for people like us to be able to talk about and what we felt was important in ways that we felt they needed to it needed to be discussed, and so Irwin was very instrumental in getting people able to do that. So I want to rewind a little bit to seventy two. Howard was talking about some of the rules that the Federal Communications Commission put in in nineteen seventy five. I was a on my uh, co op. I was an Antioch College student. I went to D.C. I worked for a magazine called Access, of all things. This was the former FCC commissioner, Nick Johnson, who was you know, really a, a revolutionary in seeing what was about to happen. And that's where I learned about public educational governmental channels. So that had always been the core of, uh, of, you know, that's sort of the core of my DNA in my career. And when I was living in Davis Square, I was able to get a job at um, Warner Cable, being their last, uh, being the director at the time. I didn't know I was gonna be the last one. And what Charlie said was 100% true. I mean, I was there, you know, getting nickel and dimed um, for any little thing we would need. We'd have to go to corporate for budget, and you know, it would take six months, and they would tell you no, of course. And but at the very end, when it was during the licensing period, uh, all of a sudden money started freeing up because Warner didn't want to do anything to um, to you know put that license in jeopardy. So there was an infusion of money to at least buy some equipment and upgrade it a little bit. But at that point, the train had left the station, and the city had decided that, uh, you know, we, we know that what's happening. You're, you're going to put a little money into it, make everyone happy, but, you know, we're going to take the, you know, the city decided we're going to take the access away uh, at that time. So, so we, were, we, were day, we were at Day Street mm -hmm. next to the post office. Um, then for a year, we rented the Somerville Media Action Project because that was a youth-run um, community media center. Mm -hmm. We rented their facilities while we were building this. So SCAT was up and running. We were in temporary location, took about a year to build this building, and then we moved into, th into this building. And when you say this building, we are at 90 Union Square, which has been the home of SCAT TV. Uh, in fact, locals call it the SCAT building. <laughs> for, th for those of you watching somewhere on the internet. So at that time, was it completely normal for a city to be jumping in and saying everybody has the right to be on cable TV? Uh, Somerville was one of the first cities that, uh, certainly I, I believe in Massachusetts it was the first city that set up a, a separate independent nonprofit corporation. There were some others around, uh, around the, in the country. Uh, and then after you know, Somerville and then w was the beginning of that curve and we, you know, hundreds and hundreds of stations like this were established around the country uh, because of that franchise fee that Howard talked about. So five percent of the revenues uh, went into into the you know in from the went from the cable company into these access corporations. 
So um, there were, you know, literally every state had access corporations. You know, what's ha you know many of them have since, uh, you know, the rules have changed, the numbers have changed, funding is down, people, you know, the cable companies aren't making as much money as they used to be. So, um, so not all the stations have survived. And I think that's the miracle of Somerville Community Access Television, Somerville Media Center, is that this organization has been able to morph. So yes, cable, you know, and TV still may be the core, but you're doing lots of other things, you know, podcasts, you know, training youth, uh, you know, things like that, that make it, a you know, as a, a more vibrant place that reflects what's happening in the media environment today. You know, w you know when SCAT started, it was the only game in town for people to self-express. Um, and, you know, you had all sorts of people here. Um, you know, just, you know, just the, the, the rainbow of the community was here and people had never been on TV before, the first time ever on television or the first time ever behind the cameras. I think being behind the cameras is as important as being on camera because by, by being part of the process, you all of a sudden learn media literacy and you all of a sudden begin to watch television with a different set of eyes if you've either created it or been in front of the camera. So I think that is one of the lasting legacies of any of these community access stations is people just got a lot smarter about what was going on in the media. And as the internet came and podcasting came, people were, you know, were, were able to take their skills and what they've learned in the media literacy and use it in other, you know, in other medium. So you were SCAT's first executive Correct. director and then you went to Cambridge as their first executive director. Correct. How many access stations have you actually had a hand in at this point? That was it, just two. <laughs> after Cambridge, no offense to my friends in Cambridge, after Cambridge, that was enough. <laughs> Somerville was a joy to work in, and I, I, I say this, and I'm, I'll be a little critical of my friends in Cambridge. And Somerville people always said thank you, and we're so appreciative of the work we did. Hmm. In Cambridge, it was more, well, that's all? Hmm. What, what else are you going to do for me? Hmm. Um, and you know, so I was there for, I built that the building there in Kendall Square. Uh, and at one point it was time to move on, and I went to work for the Mass Corporation for Educational Telecommunications with Linda. Th with Linda. Then I got involved in video conferencing, and now I work at Forrester Research out in Life. So all these things are very connected, um, you know, from, from working, at the, uh, working at Access Magazine to where I am at Forrester Research is very connected. But, you know, my, my just most wonderful moments were when I was running SCAT, personally. It is a cool job yeah. to have, I have to tell you. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very poor, well, perhaps not the same shoes, but um, we, let, let's talk about uh, the old days, uh, because you, you mentioned, Linda, that TV was the way to express yourself. Mm -hmm. What were those first programs? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dead Air Live, probably. Word, yeah. yeah, I can't remember. I don't, I don't remember all that far back <laughs> no, no I was not uh, I was not um, actively producing uh, video at scat when it first started I was producing video elsewhere before scat in the BS times I, I don't know how, to <laughs> how exactly to put that the the um, before scat what kind of w when people uh, there wasn't a tradition of folks walking into a station and putting their things on air, as Charlie did, what kinds of videos out would, would people produce? Well, I worked for an organization in Boston called Urban Planning Aid, and we had um, there a video facility, and we would take our video equipment and teach people how to use it who were part of community organizations all around Boston. And they would take their videos and then they would organize group settings where they would show the videos. Um, it was a very powerful way to organize. I also um, worked with women in prison and took my slept my half inch portable 40 pound video equipment out there and worked with the women to get them to tell their own stories. And sometimes just playing the videos back to a person, you get to see yourself as others see you mm -hmm. and differently. And again, it was more just organizing groups and showing it in groups. So public access was a way to really use television for organizing and learning 
where you had a much larger audience than just sitting in a room. I, you wanted to grab the mic there? Yeah, because I, I want to talk about one particular show yeah. that illustrates the importance of public access, and it's also a tribute to Dead Air, which we know is the longest running public access show in America. But um, after uh, I left the city of Somerville, I was fortunate enough to become the executive director of what's called the Massachusetts Cable Television Commission, un working for Governor Dukakis. So I was really involved with cable television policy around the state. And one day, I got a call from Mayor Brune. And Mayor Brune said, you know, Howard, Dead Air Live is going to put on as a play the reenactment of the transcript of a trial of Representative Vinnie Pirro. And I'm getting a lot of pressure to not let that happen. You may not even know that this happened, Charlie, that I got this call. I don't know if we ever talked about it. I know that there was something involving Tip O'Neill. Well, a lot, of pe a lot of people, and I was at the state then, and they thought that maybe, you know, there was something I could do. And I, I, and I said to the mayor, I said, Mayor Bruhn, you know, this is exactly why we set up Somerville Community Access Television the way we did, with an independent board, an independent funding stream. You know something? You can tell anyone that's putting pressure on you, I have no control over this channel. And that's exactly what he did. As a result, the show went on, the trial was reenacted, and then there was an election in which a historic thing happened, which is that Sal Albano became, uh, actually Vinnie Pearl was a state senator, sorry, ran a campaign right after these, th these uh, shows had been uh, cable cast on public access and won on a sticker campaign, which is a very, very hard way to win a state Senate seat. And at, the, only uh, the only time it happened. But that, that is, to me, a quintessential moment as to the importance of having this independent channel that is not controlled by anybody but the users. So with that, let me... I, I, can I just... Okay, this is in a little interesting tidbit, but Mayor Kurt to Tony asked me for those, ta for the, for those recordings because I, I have archived, and I went, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> that's all. That's all I wanted to add. Here you go. So we will get to JoJo in a little bit because she's kind of the kid when it comes to Dead Air Live. She had productions in the last 20 years. But I just, to, to set the scene, and uh, we might, I, I know everybody's going to jump in on this because this is what kind of put SCAT, uh, it just, it, notorious, infamous, um, <sighs> bastion of free speech. So... Uh, there was, Vinnie Pirro was a state representative. He was up on bribery charges and beat the rap, well, it not necessarily beat the rap twice, but he, the, there was, uh, he was not found guilty twice. Those, uh, he was up for election. Uh, the Democrat who uh, was up against him in the preliminary elections uh, was, uh, he, er, I guess it was a primary because for parties. Uh, in Somerville, if you are the Democrat, you pretty much walk into office. So that primary is the big race. Sal Albano didn't win, and then Charlie took <laughs> the reins. So um, if, if, if we could pass the, the mic to Charlie, because what he did was he organized a table reading of the transcript of the trials. And Vinnie Pirro, state rep, who was up for a uh, election the next day, stormed into this building, if I'm correct. Uh, no, he didn't storm into the building. No? Uh, no. Um, I don't think he was even there that night. No, we, uh, were, we were at SMAP. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it was at SMAP. Oh, what, um, there was, it was already controversial, this event, mm -hmm. right? And obviously, uh, you know, and Vinnie Pirro had his side, and um, and they were really upset because we were doing this show the night before the election, and they thought, "Oh, that's really unfair. Um, we won't have a chance to respond, etc." So we ceded to them 
some of our time that we had reserved so that they could come on after our show and do a rebuttal mm -hmm. or whatever. So they were there for that. Got it. Um, but yeah. But there, there is tape out there that WBZ Channel 4 has of a Vinnie Pirro with one of these big cameras um, <laughs> following him out into the hall screaming. <laughs> Um, because the, the table reading of his trial was pre-taped. It was aired election night, if I understand correctly. And it was, then he it was came live that building. night. Hmm? It was live that night. It was live that night. Yes. Huh. There are many versions of this story. Well, thank you for <laughs> correcting that. Um, so uh, I keep, you know, in a lot of, a lot of this, it, we put together a exhibit at the Somerville Museum. We are the first cable access center in Massachusetts. This is worthy of a historical exhibit. And Vinny, the Vinny Pirro tapes are there in a glass case, <laughs> uh, which, uh, among other things, there's an award for Howard Horton he never picked up. It's there at the museum if you want it. Um, but there's, I this is a moment in our history. And I, every time I see something, I keep thinking, why? Why did you do this? Why, why this particular way of getting the word out about, tr about uh, Vinnie Pirro? It was the only way we had, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, there was, there were newspaper articles about it and stuff like mm -hmm. that, right? But our viewership that night was pretty fantastic, I'm pretty sure. A lot of people were watching. Um, and, it, and so that was a way to do it. And we wanted it to be dramatic. We wanted to have an impact on the election. Um, this guy was a criminal, and he's walking around and he's, you know, campaigning, and he he's thinks he's going to get elected to be a state senator, and he's a criminal, and that wasn't right. That wasn't right. He wasn't doing anything in our interests. He was in his own interest. He was out collecting bribe money. That was what he was doing, and you know. What else can I say about it? I mean, it, it was just entirely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Erwin right. had a, a you, you had some, uh, something to say on the subject. So this, this is when we were in the Sumbrell Media Action Project building. Mm -hmm. So this is, SCAD is less than a s six months old at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, here's this brand new organization trying to figure out how to maneuver through this, you know, through the situation. You know, Dead Air Live came to you know came to me and said, "This is what we're doing." It was actually very creative. It was just reading transcripts. It wasn't interpretation. Mm -hmm. It was which is reading reading the official transcript, and I did not know behind the scenes what was going on. I never heard from Gene Brune. I never heard from Howard that you know there's pressure. Uh, I mean, I I give the city you know the mayor a lot of credit because you know you know we got pressure from other places. I remember we hired a police detail that night because we just didn't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, there's a lot of media coverage. Channel 2 was there, Channel 4 was there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it, it told the community that, you know, this is what we're here for. And, you know, we're going to, you know, not let these, let, let the production go. It's our obligation to let, let the production go. Same way Howard explained it, we didn't have any control over it either. So, you know, some of the, sh you, know, you, know, uh, you know, over the years, some of the shows that, you know, have been presented, I mean, you know, pretty, you know, pretty raw, but, you know, you s we set that tone right from day one mm. that, you know, if people want to, you know, get on, you know, get on the air and, and, you know, and tell their story, you know, in whatever way that makes sense to them, they were going to do it. So it was really a triumph and, you know, all the other public access stations in the country, you know, saw what was going on and it became, you know, you know, it's a, it's an interesting summer story. But it really became, you know, part of the national fabric of what was happening with public access. Again, because it was so early in in the organization's uh, development that we could have we could have caved, and it would have been a very different organization. So, Howard, it, the the way that cable was cur it, the way we're currently funded, cable company takes a bit of its profit off the top, pays the city. The city then gives that to our budget. Now, in the past, there have been mayors who disliked what was going on in the building, held up the funds. Uh, there was a uh, somebody who decided that the right thing to do, uh, well, we are named SCAT, uh, was to poop in the middle of the main studio and broadcast that on air. The mayor then withheld our funding. 
So uh, was that always the case? So in, in the initial conception of creating Somerville Community Access Television, uh, with Mayor Brune, we made a determination that the funding should go directly to SCAT from the cable company mm -hmm. and not pass through the municipality as an appropriation. And that was a very deliberate decision. We designated funding to go right to SCAT so there was not that relationship of having to go hat in hand to the city and so that the city wouldn't have a chilling effect because perhaps uh, the scenario that I just described or we all des described, if, this, if the money was coming to SCAT and Dead Air Live wanted to do the transcripts of their trial, perhaps that never would have happened. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was intentionally set up for the funding to be independent. The other thing that was intentional is the board of directors was set up so that it would be self-replenishing, just initially appointed by Mayor Brune, but then become community-based and replenish itself. So the idea was to make it completely independent. That did change, uh, and I, I wasn't involved uh, in the second renewal with um, Mayor Capuano when uh, the funding stream then was diverted into the city and then needed to be appropriated out of the city. That was a change through a change in mayors. But while Mayor Brune was uh, mayor, we had that funding go directly to SCAT. It had no, no involvement with municipal finance at all. So in the case of the transcripts that Charlie arranged to be read on air, that gave Gene Brune a buffer. Exactly. And he it gave the Somerville Producers Group and SCAT a buffer. Correct. Correct. Is that how cable access is run around the country still today? Or yeah, is there? It, 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 there's a variety. Mm -hmm. There's a variety because uh, I also went into private practice um, after I left the cable commission. I probably represented 50, and s 50 to 60 towns and cities in Massachusetts and always used SCAT as a model, setting up uh, access corporations and trying to separately fund them. Uh, but but there, are, there are examples where it goes through municipal appropriation uh, as it does, uh, I believe, as it does now in the city. So it, it's a variety. What's interesting, and I, I mentioned this uh, as we were talking before, there was an interesting, just because I, I find policy interesting, in 2019, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, had a ruling. There was a case in Manhattan where two producers sued the Axis Corporation that was running uh, because the, the Axis Corporation said we don't want to put on, I don't remember what the program was, but they tried to prevent a program. It got all the way to the Supreme Court, and in that case, the Supreme Court, and this was just two years ago, actually said uh, a community-run nonprofit access channel does have editorial discretion, could prevent it because it wasn't representing government. This is, here's the irony. Mm -hmm. While we try to keep government out, if government was more involved, it would be considered more of a pure First Amendment forum. So that, that's a little bit of a wrinkle. It was a five to four decision. Uh, it was a very narrow decision. And that is this particular that, that, court. That was that, this particular court. Yeah. So technically speaking, right now I would uh, describe the status of the law that Somerville Community Access Television probably could exert, if it wanted to, mm -hmm. editorial discretion. Uh, but I really believe the intention, if you look at all the policy that I tra uh, trace back to the Fairness Doctrine, the intention was this was a pure soapbox. It was a f intended to be a First, Amendment, a First Amendment forum. There were words in the language, first come, first serve, no editorial control. And I, I believe that was the true intent, and hopefully this uh, very now narrow decision will not impact um, access channels going forward in other places. But JoJo, this is the legacy you inherited. You became one of the kids uh, coming in for uh, Dead Air Live um, and, and became a lead producer for many, many years. Well, I, my inspiration was Charlie Tesh over here because Charlie, yeah, you Charlie, so thank you. Charlie's been with uh, Dead Air Live since the beginning, maybe a year later, but pretty much the beginning. And the way it started with me is I was in the lobby of SCAT TV, and I was looking for people to help me with my children's show that I just, I filmed a show at Hearst Argyle at CBS, and I spent a ton of money. And someone said, have you considered coming to your local access station? So I came here the next night, and Mike Hall, one of the Somerville producers, said to me, we're short-handed, can you come into the studio and you know, work one of the cameras, and I went, sure, why not? And I didn't know anything about cameras. I really didn't. And before you know it, I was behind the camera, and I got the bug. 
and I loved it. It was great. I said, I am all in. I mean, I just knew it. I, it just felt like I can't even explain it to you. I was like so charged up. Well, after being with SCAT TV, it started in 2003, uh, I guess Scott Bowden said, you know, we have all these shows and all these tapes and nothing's going on with them and we need to archive them. So I started thinking, well, if I take this job on, it's going to be a ton of work. But I decided to do it. I think I archived about 760 shows with all different types of formats, three-quarter inch, Super 8, VHSC, uh, what, uh, so many types. And Charlie had to come over to my house because I was doing this from my home and basically rescue me because the tapes were disintegrating and the emulsion from the tapes was falling off because they, I guess over time, tape just doesn't stand the test of time. And uh, it, was, it took me three years. Three years. And SCAT TV did pay me $5 a show. So now you know what I got paid <laughs> for 760 shows. But what a ride. What a ride being here. Terrific organization. And now you, Cat Powers, mm -hmm. you're the director. I'm a steward. There's, there's a lot of history here that, that <laughs> I'm a steward of. So the... Um, the exhibit that folks here put together at the Somerville Museum, which is on display until July 9, there are all of those tapes that you uh, that you reference. There's three quarter inch. There's VCRs. There's high eight. There's reel to reel. There's um, there's even a program that somebody tried to save on hard disks. Uh, the the little tiny squares that we used to put into. Oh right, uh, yeah. I wasn't concert. involved with 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 that end, but yeah. <laughs> So there, the what kinds of different shows were possible because you were at SCAT? Oh my goodness! I got to tell you one of my favorite shows because I've been asked this. What was one of your favorite shows? And I met this doctor, Dr. Tom Tam, and Dr. Tom Tam heals people with these dolls that he taps with a hammer. Do you remember that show? And a bunch of people came in with their dolls, showing all the meridians. And there were people in the audience, and he would say, um, Cat, do you have any problems? Do you have any pains? And you would say, yeah, well, my lower back. And he would tell everybody to tap C5 or whatever it was on the body. And everybody would go tap, 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 tap. And he would say, how you feel? How you feel? And you would say, you, geez, I, you, you were feeling something because you had all this energy that was directed towards you, but they would tap it in, into these, like, they look like little voodoo dolls. So that was pretty bizarre. It was very easy, and it's still easy. If you want people to be talent on a show, it's very easy because everybody wants to be on camera. They love being on camera. And it's very hard to say no to me, so... I, did, I always found it easy to find talent. And there's still people today that ask me, you're still doing that show? I want to go on, you know, that show. Oh, yeah, there's always people that want to do shows. Hmm. So in going through our archives here, we found all kinds of ways that people would get the word out about shows. My favorite was because there was no Internet and because you couldn't look at TV Guide, which... Um, if you're younger than dirt, there there used to be a little magazine that you would pick up at the grocery store and you'd be there with Market Basket and you could pick up and figure out where Magnum P.I. was or whatever the show was of the day. And cable access was never listed in those big publications. So to get the word out about what was going on, folks would actually mimeograph um, flyers that were then posted in the neighborhood so everybody knew when to, to play that show on Channel 3. So in those days, Charlie, what was your favorite show at the time? Oh, my God. <laughs> I can't really say. Um, there was, yeah, I can't say. There were so many good shows, and it was so much very interesting stuff. We did, 
a lot of programs on uh, things like what was going on in Central America, for example, um, you know, and a real people's eye view of what was going on there. We did a bunch of stuff like that. Um, you know, the School of the Americas that was training the death squads in Central America, all that kind of stuff we, we put on. Um, uh, lots of political shows, um, a lot of, you know, just regular election debates and stuff like that. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention one thing um, about what Howard was talking about uh, and the role of the city versus the, versus the, cap uh, the public access facility. Mm -hmm. um, we did a show, one of our election shows, it was uh, before a primary, and it was, uh, I don't remember the year. Anyway, the, the show was introducing three new women candidates, people who hadn't run for office before. And it was just, you know, a regular talk show in the studio. The three people talk to, you know, took turns talking, et cetera. Okay. Well, Mayor Capuano was so upset that we put these people on who weren't like his favorite people, perhaps, or whatever, that he withheld the funds from SCAT for nine months. All right. We had to borrow money in order to keep the operation going. Okay, that's what we're trying to avoid with all of that. So it was mostly pretty effective, but <laughs> you know, not always. Anyway. The, there's the, the, the word community and SCAT. Um, you've all talked a little bit about the community and how it was reflected in cable. What about the community among producers and the camaraderie? Can you, can you, how do you build community with a, with a television show? It, cameras, the folks here on cameras are not, uh, one's texting. The, uh, there's, it, there doesn't appear to be community among here. How, how does a show have that esprit de corps? Just the one show or the, the whole Shows organization? Um, well, there was a fair amount of sharing that went on and, and organizing kinds of stuff. I and mean, we would have, not very regular, but often we would have meetings of the whole membership. So people could come and talk about what their issues were, you know, what was working, what wasn't working, and, make, and then follow that up with recommendations to the board of directors. Mm -hmm. So that was a chance for everybody to be involved and have their input into how the organization ran. You want to say something? Oh, yeah. Jojo and Irwin have an opinion on this. Yeah. yeah, I think, well, this was, we were a family here. And when we were working in the studio together, there was a lot of heat going on because it's live. Mm -hmm. And you're down to the wire. Everything's got to be done. And it's, it's very chaotic. You have the talent coming in. But <clears throat> what was really interesting was what happened with our group afterwards. We would get pizza, and we would sit down, and we would discuss the show. And boy, was you guys were so critical of everything I did. But I welcomed that. They were rough on me. They, 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 they were heartless, what they would say. And they would pick on me because they knew that it would make me stronger and better. Boy, did I learn a lot from that criticism. It's, it was actually a good thing because I wanted to be as good as Charlie. Okay, well, but. It wasn't heartless, Jojo. You don't <laughs> think, <laughs> it was. It was definitely not heartless. Oh, you, uh, please. No, no, I mean, you know, we had, we, de we definitely had ideas of what a show should look like and what kind right. of quality should be in it, that's for sure. And we would try to promote that and get people to do it. But, um, you know, no, it was definitely not heartless, JoJo. <laughs> but, it, but it worked, didn't it? It did work. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. And you're not unhappy about it? No, not okay, at all. So, not at all. So, that's it. so Irwin would like to share on this, but I have to say that nobody here is, is known for withholding their opinions. I do think that uh, your question's an interesting one about uh, community amongst the, all the members. Mm -hmm. You know, each individual show had their own, you know, of ecosystem of their own. And I do think that was an area that we didn't um, fully take advantage of. The, you know, 
you know, you're so busy running the running the operation day to day. Where you saw a community was in the classes. So you'd have a class of eight people who were learning, you know, uh, you know, studio production or or editing or whatever it, whatever it was, and you would see people coalesce. You know, as my career developed and I started working in um, in software as a service companies, tech companies, one thing that that those companies do is, and I, I, I loved, it was my favorite thing when I worked at, at, at those companies, was user group meetings, where basically you get the users of the product together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a city, you fly out to, you know, Minneapolis and you bring 20, 20 users together, and then their voice got heard back. You know, you, you would take that information back to, you know, headquarters and say, this is what we heard in Minneapolis amongst our users. So I do think that that's an area that that the access stations, it's sort of a little counterintuitive that the access stations didn't really cr create the community amongst all their users because it was sort of almost, it was, it was, like, it was sort of de facto there's a community because, because we're just all in this building, but you have to nurture those communities as well. Yeah. Uh, and that's the lesson I learned, you know, from just doing literally hundreds of user groups of, of 20, 30, 40, 50 customers of ours, bringing them together. So I would urge, you know, any access station to, you know, learn a little bit from the way some of the businesses operate. Uh, I know that SCAD actually is, is doing some of that today or the media center by, mm -hmm. you know, being, by um, being able to uh, lease equipment and, you know, professional services and studio mm -hmm. time so that you can generate revenue. And I think that's, that's perfectly healthy uh, because it gives, it gives the members an opportunity to work on programs that are outside of their comfort zone as well. The, uh, you, uh, you folks have the wisdom here, but there's a definite community in the building where, you know, somebody walks in and says, uh, oh, you know, I'm, 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 I've got, uh, I'm working from home now and I'm just kind of looking for friends and I'm kind of interested in media. So I often just kind of pull them aside and say, oh, you know, Tuesday nights there's a show, Dead Air Live, or, you know, what one, one of the other programs. Is there, um, is this common among, uh, you've had the job, Howard, of, of being the guy working from the state looking down at cable access stations. Is that common? Yeah, I, I think what's common, and I, I, I wanted to uh, reiterate something that Linda said earlier, is that when people think about television, uh, they automatically focus on the audience. Mm. And what Access does, it, 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 it flips it around and focuses it on the user. Mm. Because the, the user, when I saw the user, the creator. The user is not the person sitting in front of the television. No, no, it's not. The user is the producer, the creator, the mm -hmm. talent. And, and, and uh, it really, this term from broadcasting to narrow casting, so you can have a youth group, you can have a Little League game, you can have a baking show. All those people that Linda mentioned that get involved with the show are they're a little community, they're learning literacy, and they're 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 having a, a great activity. And and so you can't measure on, you know, you're not gonna put a public access channel on a Nielsen rating. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is to at times they will be to the heights with something like the Vinnie Piero uh, tape trial tapes and that will have a, a, a large impact, but most of the time it's gonna be a smaller impact of, of user groups that are having a great time and contributing to the community by just using the channel. Is it worth the, our community, Somerville, funding that kind of small groups, those programs? Yeah, in, 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 in my opinion, it's well worth it, and what's interesting for a while with all these streaming services that are out there, now you cannot, I, I'm not sure, you can now get the public access on a streaming service, but for a while uh, when I was, would speak to cable companies, I said, you know, at the time the main competition was satellite and not streaming. The one advantage you have is you have community channels. And let's remember, I think when I think about access, I, I do think about it broadly. Like my favorite show, I have to admit, might have been the, the Board of Aldermen. I don't want to call that a show, but it often was. Um, the, and I have to say the other day, I don't watch public access too often, but I, I turned it on the other day, and um, actually what I saw was I saw we have a lot of new members of the city council getting trained, and it was a little scary, uh, about how a municipal budget works. It was, a, it was a session held at Tufts University, 
and I watched it for about an hour because the presenters, I learned a little bit. I, I worked in City Hall, so I know a little bit about municipal budgeting, but it was very interesting to see this and to watch our elected officials who are new because we have a lot of turnover now on the city council mm -hmm. and a lot of new people learning about what the meets and bounds are of municipal uh, budgeting. And it also showed me how much they really needed to learn. I hate to say it because I'm, <laughs> I'm on television and it's local. But um, every now and then it's great to check in. And, and I'm reluctant to give up cable because I like to get it on cable yeah. rather than streaming. Are you one of those people who also gets his news by reading a newspaper? I still read a newspaper. <laughs> I still read a newspaper. I'm, I have to admit it. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I think it's great. The um, You know, it's interesting. Uh, Linda and I, you know, uh, Erwin mentioned he was an Antioch graduate. I'm an uh -huh. Antioch graduate. Linda was in the Antioch community. We, we had a small group that came here in the mid-70s uh, from Antioch College. We established Back then in Somerville, there was a very large number of communal households, people living together, mm -hmm. six, eight people. It's the only way people could afford to live back then. <laughs> and, but but our, our, what we had a collective called Media Works, and we jumped right in. Uh, we were very interested. We were probably the only people that moved to Somerville because it had a public access channel. That's exactly right. We actually moved here. We were looking for a place. We, we wanted to, like Locust, come and see if we could make some social change and do some great things. And... Somerville was one of the only cities that had an early public access channel. Yes, it was run by the cable company, but at least it had public access. And uh, so we got involved in the community on, on a lot of different levels. And we met a lot of uh, great people like Charlie and others, uh, early pioneers. And um, I'm hoping that there's some young people out there now that are moving to city, the city of Somerville to get involved with the media center and get involved with new technology and to see what they can do to make it a better place. Uh, so I wanted to give another example of the kind of uh, users, user mm -hmm. community involvement. Um, Al Bohr was the director of the Elizabeth Peabody House, um, which had moved from the West End in Boston over to uh, uh, Broadway in Somerville by Foss Park. And it was, their programs were mainly for kids there. And he instituted a video program where kids would learn how to produce shows. And he hired uh, people from the community to do that. Um, one was uh, Barry McQuilkin. Uh, Barry was one of the original uh, people in Dead Air Live. And uh, so he got hired to work with the kids there. And so he got equipment from SCAT and uh, brought it there, and they, or brought the kids down in here, and, um, and they learned how to do, do productions. And sometimes they were on our show. They had their own show that they did for, for quite a while, um, which was uh, really, really entertaining. And they got enough out of it that several of the kids who learned from through that process went on to become basically you know, media professionals um, just from, from that experience. So you have the whole connection there from the grassroots through the, through the cable system and the educational process and the kids getting jobs and passing that on to other people in the future. So that was, I thought, a really great thing. Um, yeah. Charlie, what did you get out of it? You did, a, you put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into these productions. What did you get out of it? A lot of fun. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, you asked about favorite shows. Um, I don't have like specific favorite shows, but one of the things that I really liked was the music shows that we did. And so we would have, you know, a whole group of people in here. Uh, we would have extra cameras that we hooked into the switcher, so mm -hmm. we, we always had at least four cameras that we were using. And and then we just did it live. There was no rehearsal or anything like that. You know, we would do the setup. We pretty much knew what we needed to do to make it work. And uh, and but then the show would start. And at the beginning of the show, it's like, well, you know, we don't really know what they're doing exactly and how things are, you know, going to move around. And 
who's communicating with whom and how, all that stuff. But after about 10 minutes or so, things really started to gel. And we would get into something that I've learned now to call group flow. And that's a process where everyone is just totally focused on what you're doing and is aware of what everybody else is doing. And so there's a, a tremendous cooperative effort. And you just feel like your energy is going with everything else, you know, and you're just going with mm -hmm. it. And it's a tremendous experience. And I loved it, and other people loved it as well. All right. So I'm your executive director, who's kind of running the joint now, uh, facilitating it so that more of these programs can come in. What should this place look like in the next? Well, you've seen the first 39 years. What should the next 39 look like? Can I start briefly? Yes. These lighting instruments here, we have got only three left. Well, there's another one over there. Okay. These are the originals. These are ones that we inherited from Warner Cable. <laughs> and I'm sure Warner Cable, they weren't new to them either, <laughs> you know. They were definitely used. So they're probably 60 years old or something <laughs> like that, you know. And now, this is okay. These three work but the rest of them are all dead, and we haven't had them replaced for 20 years or so, and so that's a real problem if you're gonna try to do a complex show in here. Mm -hmm. And we often did two sets, you know. Um, yeah, so different things could be going on, you know, one would be getting ready while the other was happening or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but you know, you can't do it with just three lighting ut utensils. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'll say example. next 39 years is just keeping up with technology because you have the you have the heart here. It's just keeping up with technology. Howard. I think you should give Charlie Tesh a 10 year contract for producing <laughs> Dead Air Live uh, <laughs> to start with. But um, I love what you're doing in terms of the di diversification uh, in terms of getting into podcasts, radio, streaming. I think that's the direction. And I do want to put a plug in. I think SCAT and the Media Center should stay in this building for the next 40 years and get rehabbed and not move. Absolutely. And I think SCAT is valuable. Is valuable. I would equate it to a public library. It's a place where people can come and rather than taking out books or tapes, making them, and I see it as a really valuable center for the city. All right, I first executive director, last word. Pivot, pivot with the times. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm Kat Powers. This has been Dead Air Live. Thank you very much for your time tonight. I'll just be quiet on the set for a second. I'm getting the wrap it up message. All right. All right. So uh, thank you very much for your time tonight. The exhibit of the Scott Archives of Firehouse Reels are on display at the Somerville Museum until July 9. This Dead Air Live production has been part of that exhibit. I hope you come see some of the history these folks have created there.